Hey everyone, welcome back to another video. My name's Laura, for those of you who haven't seen a video yet from me. And today we're gonna to take a look at IB psychology and specifically the cognitive approach. So we're gonna keep going from the last video. So last time I talked about schema theory and for those of you who watched that video, you'll know that what we talked about is that schemas aren't the most reliable and they're quite susceptible to kind of external influences. And that's kind of the gist of a lot of topics within the cognitive approach to psychology. So that's what, what we're gonna keep going with a little bit today, which is this idea that a lot of cognitions and a lot of cognitive processes are quite weak when it comes to looking at them kind of under more of a scientific microscope in the sense that our processes are quite innately human in the sense that they're just not perfect. So specifically what we're going to look at today is memory and look at how memory isn't really the most reliable. So in fact, memory is so susceptible to influence that we can create entirely false memories, not even to mention that we can distort memories. Um, and obviously that's quite a crucial thing considering that people do go to jail based on things like eyewitness testimony, which relies solely on actually accurately recalling information and scenes. So as I said, let's begin by talking about this memory reliability. And since eyewitness testimony is a huge field, it's this whole sub subject is really interesting to people because it's how we can actually deduce if someone is lying without even meaning to. So someone might have the best intentions, for example, in a court case, but they might actually be distorting the events of the scene that they're recalling because they've kind of altered memories. And that's for a couple of different reasons. So Bartlett, who we talked about in the last video on schemas, who's huge within um, memory and cognitive research, he basically has quite a famous saying that human memory isn't an exact replica, but rather what we call an active reconstructor. So we don't photograph things that happen in the real world in our head in some mental camera. Instead, we take kind of pieces of information from an event and adapt them and create a memory based on that. So it's not really perfect. It's in fact quite susceptible um, to influences. So there's specifically three key distortions and we'll talk about two of them today. So distortions are basically errors that can kind of happen in the creation of a memory. So for example, in the encoding process, so when you are creating a memory or in the retrieval process, which is when you're trying to recall a memory later on. And so the two that we'll focus on today are leading questions and weapon focus. So leading questions are when the language that was used to question a witness about events that they saw actively affects how they remember it and recall it. And this could have something to do with our last topic. So the whole schema theory concept would suggest that because you're activating certain schemas, then we might generalize or adapt or mold this information that we're coming across to fit those schemas, which means that we'll remember events differently than how they actually happened. So that's leading questions, and we'll start by looking at that. And then we'll go into weapon focus, which is quite an interesting um, field within memory reliability, which is, it's this concept that if a weapon is used in a crime, then the witness's attention is likely to focus on the weapon, which means their attention isn't focused on the actual perpetrator of the crime. So you can imagine that if you're removing the focus from the details of the scene to um, kind of one specific aspect, which kind of drags or grabs attention like a weapon, then you'd completely disregard and ignore all the, the um, characteristics, for example, of the criminal. So therefore your memory of the scene is unreliable because you might just be focusing on, for example, um, a gun, and then you might be actively reconstructing what the criminal looked like because you're trying to fill in the gaps, but really you're kind of working backwards, which as you, we discussed in schema theory, that doesn't usually work if you're trying to work backwards to make information fit something that you know now, when really at the time that information wasn't really that accessible to you or not even that interesting to you. It's not something you really picked up on. So that's what we'll talk about um, in our second study. So 
To begin with, let's talk about a very famous study that I'm sure you've heard of in IB psychology already, and that's the Loftus and Palmer study. So what this study did was they were aiming to investigate the effect of leading questions on the memory of a car crash. So what they did is they had 45 American participants and they were shown a video of a car crash. Then they were asked about the speed of the cars. Specifically, they were asked the question, how fast were the cars going when they blank into each other? And blank was filled in by one of five verbs. So these participants were split into five groups and that meant that they were either asked how fast were the cars going when they smashed, collided, bumped, hit or contacted each other. So what they were trying to do is to see if the intensity or kind of like severity of the action that the verb was implying affected the speed that participants estimated. So basically, if it sounded like a more intense crash, something like smash would make it sound like cars were going at full speed, then would that mean that participants would guess that? And would that be different than if the cars just contacted each other? So that's what they were trying to investigate. And what they actually found was that in the group where they were told that the cars smashed, the average estimation of speed was 41 miles per hour, whereas in the contacted group, it was 32 miles per hour. So considering that this is an averaged estimation, then that's quite a significant difference. So almost 10 miles per hour of a difference, even though it was the exact same video. All participants saw the exact same video, exact same angle, everything. So this was purely based on that one verb being changed. And this is a really good example of a study that has a great rigorous experimental method because they were purely manipulating one thing, which was the verb, and everything else was controlled within reason. So basically it meant that they could narrow down the effect, the cause and effect, which in this case meant that by changing the verb, they produced a different speed estimation. Then they took it one step further and they called the participants of the study back later on and asked them if they had seen broken glass at the scene. But actually, there was no broken glass. And what they found was that 32% of the smashed group saw glass and 14% of the hit group saw glass. So again, a huge difference in the severity of the of the verb led to this intense insane guess that there was glass at the scene when really there wasn't actually any glass whatsoever so just because you have this schema that you hold that makes you believe that if cars are going at a really high speed there will probably be glass from the crash then you're more likely to kind of fill in the blanks if someone asks you about it and this could be because there's a pressure to kind of answer the question and make sure that you're giving as much detail as possible. Sometimes it could also be that people are trying to show that they are perceptive, so they don't want to miss any detail. Um, and so this is actually something that was investigated in a follow-up study, which I'll get to in a minute. But basically what this is showing altogether is that eyewitness testimony is to some extent unreliable, clearly, and that we can have different verbs triggering different schemas. Um, but it's quite an artificial study, so quite low ecological validity, because do we know if memory works like this in real life? Not based off this study, no. It's only American students, so it makes it a little more difficult to generalize to the rest of the world, just we need a little bit of cultural variation. Um, but again, there is cause and effect shown, so it is at least a starting ground for more research on this. And then equally, there's also been follow-up research to suggest that eyewitnesses do better in real life situations. So when it's lives that are on the line, for example, in court cases, or if it's something personally relevant to them, if they're actually there, if they're witnessing a real crash, then in theory, they should be better. But again, we don't know this with 100% certainty. So this just gives us kind of a baseline again. But, but the, the study I was alluding to before that I said I'd get to later, um, the follow-up study was also by Loftus and then by someone called Zani. And this adds reliability to this study, actually. So a year later, they did this study where they asked the question, did you see the broken headlight or did you see a broken headlight? 
and using the same exact premise as the original study, so based on this car crash. And if you used the indefinite versus definite article, based on these results, we'd assume that if it was definite, more participants would think that there was a broken headlight. And that's exactly what they found. So in the a uh, broken headlight condition, 7% said they saw it, whereas 17% said that they saw the broken headlight or the broken headlight. So basically what that helps us to conclude is that this study is probably pretty reliable because we are incredibly susceptible to the phrasing of sentences and especially leading questions that indicate to us that we should be perceiving something or that is something that something is a certain way. So to follow on from that, then let's take a look at weapon focus. So it's again Loftus that did this study. So Loftus is a very well-known researcher within psychology, um, but it isn't just Loftus who did this on her own. So just to clarify as well, just because this comes up in a lot of studies, and I know some people within IB psychology are confused. When we say et al, that basically just means and colleagues. So that's usually if there is about five or more um, people who worked on the study, then we just say et al as an abbreviation so that we don't have to remember all the words. So just a little keynote to bear in mind. But this study was looking at weapon focus. So they wanted to see what would happen if someone emerged with a weapon as opposed to with a normal object. So what they did is participants heard a discussion in the room next to them and half of the participants then saw a man exiting that room with greasy hands holding a pen and the other half of the participants saw a man exiting the room holding a bloody pen knife. So what we'd expect to see is that most participants would be focusing on the weapon. So they were then asked to identify the man from a selection of 50 pictures that they saw holding um, the gun, or uh, sorry, in this case, the knife. And what they found was that the no weapon condition was much more accurate. So if they'd been asked, describe um, and picture what what person was holding the knife, then they probably would have really struggled. They'd have kind of been scrambling in their mind to remember, hmm, what did that person look like? So when they were given photos, they'd probably just have gone with their best guess, but it wouldn't have been very accurate because they were focusing on the knife. Whereas if they were asked to um, choose the picture of the person who was holding the pen, even without the pictures, they'd probably be able to reconstruct an image in their brain. And so then when they saw the pictures, they'd think, oh, easy, it's that person. So it meant that since they were more accurate in the no weapon condition, that probably the we weapon focus is in fact a true distortion on memory reliability because it means that we focus all our attention on the, um, on the knife or the gun in another case. So there is actually evaluation of this which suggests that maybe it's not that the weapons are distracting because they're weapons maybe it's because they're unexpected or oddly distracting items that you don't expect to see so a guy named pickle actually investigated this further and found that it wasn't the weapon that was distracting it was that any unusual items draw focus so he actually did a lab experiment where someone was also holding celery. So rather than emerging with a pen, it was holding celery or holding a knife. And they found that actually the celery distracted attention too. So really that goes to show that it's not necessarily the weapon. It could be any object. And that's not to say that this isn't valid research, the Loftus et al study. In fact, it's in a way supported by Pickle's findings, it's just that probably if a crime was committed, regardless of what the weapon is, or if there was something unusual that the criminal was holding, that would probably draw attention. And so that would go on to distort memory. So it does show the, the lack of reliability of memory, but it's not to say that it's fully dependent on it being a weapon. That's the unusual thing. But altogether, that shows us that memory is unreliable and that we probably shouldn't trust eyewitness testimony wholeheartedly. We, that's why usually you need more evidence than just eyewitness testimony. But then again, there are cases that go through solely based on that. 
So it's just something to be aware of as well. And it's good to show your awareness of this in um, an essay answer that this is also something that's very relevant to our world. It's very applicable. And that's why this is important research. So if you can show that you understand that this is really important findings to be delving into, um, then you're really showing your kind of global awareness. And that's something that Ivy loves. So I hope you guys enjoyed today's lesson and learned something new. Um, and I hope you tune in for the next video. In the meantime, feel free to check out our link below to OPT which is online private tuition. So you could either get myself or another of our amazing team of tutors to help you with one-on-one -on -one tutoring lessons online. Um, and if you're interested in that, like I said, just click the link. And if not, then I'll see you here again next time for the next video. Thank you and bye.